I'll try to keep on time, but do stop me. It's 41 now in this number, so at, at one past five, you should, you should stop uh, me. Uh, all right, so um, I will be speaking about an IK paper. <coughs> and uh, the IK paper is quite technical. It's on, um, on a scheme to improve on the elbow, uh, so on variational inference. But I think there's a, maybe something interesting also that's uh, more, broad, uh, more broadly applicable. So I want to use the first five minutes of this presentation to first celebrate a bit, celebrate variational inference. So variational inference uh, has a long history. Um, actually, uh, a lot of the history happened here in Cambridge. Um, and probably most of you in the audience know variational inference. Probably most of you have used it. In its full generality, as far as I know, Lawrence Saul in 96 uh, introduced it to the machine learning community or, or phrased it in the right way, of course. If you go back in physics, there's a longer history on mean field methods. And really what it allows us to do is to take an intractable quantity. Uh, in this case, uh, for the base posterior, the intractable quantity is a, a denominator, approximated in a systematic way, um, and, 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 and it yields an efficient algorithm that's generally applicable, and it has a huge success story. I think since uh, 22 years ago, it's been used in, in very many applications successfully. Um, if you have not heard of variational inference, I can show you one slide uh, that roughly shows you what it does. So here's an intractable distribution. Let's pretend that's intractable. But you have a tractable family of distributions, for example, an isotropic normal distribution here. And what you do is you iteratively adjust this, uh, the parameters of this distribution to somehow make this closer. And then once, you, once you're close enough, you stop and you say, OK, this is my proxy. This is my, uh, my result. That's a, a very cartoonish summary of variational inference. Um, so what's the con conventional view in the machine learning community of variational inference and why it's so good and why it has seen a revival in the last um, um, three or four years in the form of variational autoencoders, in the form of uh, Bayesian neural networks and so on. So it's, it's actually picked up speed again and um, there's continuous innovation. So what's the con conventional view that I want to celebrate? So the conventional view is this. You have this intractable quantity. Uh, this is called the evidence, uh, the log marginal likelihood. Um, and that's really hard. That's the quantity that you want, right? But that's really hard. You can't compute it directly. So instead, you have this elbow, this evidence lower bound. So, so this variational approach gives you a lower bound on this quantity. And then you can do some work, and you push this up. So for example, if you choose a large variational family, say a mixture family, or a full dimensional Gaussian distribution, you can, you can increasingly get closer and closer approximations. And it's, in a sense, universal if your approximation family is so large that you contain the true distribution and you spend some work finding it, then you don't make an approximation at all. It's exact. Right? So it's very satisfying from a, uh, from a computational viewpoint, <coughs> um, or in general from a, from a viewpoint. And this gap, uh, you control it by the choice of approximation. Okay? So that's really what, uh, what's a very satisfying approach. Now, there's a huge way within variational inference on, on, on what assumptions you can do, what computational tricks. And this is what drives innovation in this field. Um, <coughs> I think this plot is very similar to a plot I've seen uh, Ingen present. Uh, so I apologize, but there's kind of innovation lined up here. You have scalability and accuracy of approximations. So for example, black box variational inference makes it accessible to models where certain things are harder to compute. Uh, variational message passing, uh, also here from, from uh, John Wynn and Chris Bishop actually, is a very efficient thing for conjugate models. Stochastic variational inference for the large data setting. Um, and then it, amortization in the form of variational autoencoders really has, has given a huge boost to scalability of these methods and compatible with deep learning in a, in a fundamental sense. We also looked at this, for example, to adversarial variational base, so actually retaining the advantage of amortization and scalability, but actually giving larger variational families. So this is really just a small snapshot. There's probably 20 other points I can put on this map, and there's probably axes I missed entirely. Um, and there's a really nice survey. Cheng already mentioned it. There's a survey actually from, uh, from Cheng and, and Hedwig uh, on advances of variational inference that gives you a snapshot. I think it may already be out of date because there's so much work that ha has happened just in the last few months. But then there's also Ingen sees this, um, uh, which uh, actually just finished a few months ago, also a snapshot of great portfolio of variational innovation uh, that has happened in the last few uh, years. So this is really exciting. Let us celebrate. Here's a snapshot of, of work just for variational autoencoders or deep probabilistic models and new techniques, for example, the whole family of normalizing flow methods that have um, really made a big difference in how accurate we can make um, variational approximations. So this is all reasons to celebrate, and I want us to all enjoy for a second how awesome <laughs> variational inference is. Yeah, um, and, and really, um, 
um, re recognize the incredible innovation that still happens. Are we done enjoying? <laughs> <laughs> so what, what could potentially be wrong with variational inference? As an earnest question, I mean, certainly uh, it, it works, and everything that works, you know, you can uh, justify in a, in a principled way as variational inference. There's certainly no reason to just discard it lightly, and I don't want to discard it at all, but I want to provide you a slightly different viewpoint to the one I just presented. And that viewpoint is just to see the elbow as an estimator, as a statistical estimator. So how does this estimator look like? So here we have the intractable quantity, the one that we can't compute, and here we have an estimator. So the estimator is a lower bound. This is a positive viewpoint. If I'm a statistician or if, uh, if I care about estimators, I would say, well, it's biased, right? And has certain bias and a certain variance. Now, one, quantity, uh, one problem that the elbow has is, um, so here, here's an illustration of, uh, of kind of the um, bias variance trade-off. So I may have another estimator, which you know, maybe is, um, uh, has another variance and bias properties. And my goal ultimately would be to be able to spend more and more work and this bias would go away. Right? So that's the case for other approximate inference methods like MCMC. Right? MCMC is also biased for any finite time, but if I, if I run it long enough, I equilibrate and I get a sample from the stationary distribution and I get unbiased samples. Right? So MCMC has this property, variational inference doesn't. Um, and so, so that's really the, I think, one of the, one of the issues. You pick a variational family, you stick with it, you're happy with it, you optimize your code, you run inference, and the bias doesn't go away. So can we somehow fix that? Is there some, some way to fix that? <clears throat> so one, um, one method that I actually just highlighted in green on the, on the list of other methods that does somehow fix that is in the importance weighted autoencoder. I think the name is, is, is very, very bad. Um, it's essentially a different form of elbow. Let me, um, it's, it's a family of elbows. Um, and it's constructed like this. So this is, the, this is the intractable quantity that we can start. So there's two different derivations how you can derive the elbow, the variational learning objective. But this is uh, the starting point. You have this basically the, um, you do an, uh, you insert, this is a variational autoencoder setting, you insert an approximating family here, here's already amortized, you cancel it out, and this is kind of just a joint. Uh, and this thing is intractable because the expectation, the integral is intractable. And now one simple derivation of the variation uh, variational objective is to just swap logarithm and expectation by the Jensen's inequality, right? So that's kind of a very basic technique. And uh, this would give us the elbow, but what the IWE bound does is something very simple. It just says, what's the most naive approximation to this thing? Well, we can just approximate the inner expectation with some samples. There we go. Right? So, in, so instead of pulling the expectation out and then letting the logarithm do a lot of work decomposing this expression, we just do the inner, inner approximation here with, this, with samples. This sounds super naive, right? I mean, this is kind of like uh, I see an integral that I can't solve. I do naive Monte Carlo inside. <coughs> But it's a very nice approach, and the reason is you actually recover the elbow if you use one sample. Right? So it strictly generalizes the elbow. If k is equal to 1, you get the elbow. Um, you have consistency, so if k goes to larger and larger values, you actually recover the exact marginal likelihood. That's why it's called importance-weighted, because it has this limit property. And moreover, it's stochastic, monotonically ordered. So you get a family of lower bounds which are increasingly tighter, with the elbow at one end, and at the other end, you have the exact marginal likelihood. So now I ha presented you a problem. This kind of solves the problem, so now we can celebrate, right? <laughs> um, well, I don't think, so. uh, well, I think so, maybe, yes. Uh, IWE works quite well in practice. Um, but there's one more, one more thing, right? This viewpoint that I presented to you, it opens up other questions. So now we have this enlarged viewpoint of seeing the elbow as, a, as just a statistical estimator. Can we maybe control its variance in a better way? Can we maybe systematically reduce bias? Right? So which of these would be more, a more useful target? Uh, well, let's look first of all at the variance and the bias of the IWAE estimator. Right? So it's an estimator as well. It is stochastic, monotonically ordered. It's consistent, so that we know already from the original paper. So here's some, this is in the, in the, in the paper. It's not too interesting. <coughs> I'll tell you why it's not too interesting. But 
Basically, you can analyze the expectation of the IWAE expression and the variance of the IWAE expression. And both of them vanish now at the rate of 1 over k. So this is a difference between the IWAE and the elbow. For the elbow, it would not vanish. The more work you spend, it, don't, it doesn't vanish. The bias doesn't vanish. Here, it vanishes. If you use the larger and larger k, it vanishes. And the other quantity here is, this is a measure of dispersion. This is a moment expressions of a certain distribution, or basically of the log weights. Um, they both use the same quantity, second moment divided by the first moment squared. Uh, so both the variance and the bias vanish at the same rates, 1 over k times this quantity and a constant. Um, OK, so maybe there's a systematic way now. Can we maybe reduce the bias, the thing that we care about, the approximation error to the evidence, and maybe tolerate slightly bigger variance, right? So if we run SGD with mini batches, we are very happy to tolerate a lot of variance because the variance averages out while we optimize, right? So we're very happy in machine learning to accept higher variance for many problems, including maybe here for stochastic variational inference, if we can just reduce the bias. So in SGD, we have unbiased samples. Here we have a bias, but we know the rate now. <coughs> so what can we do? And this was a starting point, and then, you know, what tools do we have to systematically reduce bias? And I think these tools are not fully exploited in machine learning yet. So I think this is mo the more general part. If you don't care about variational inference, maybe there's some interesting thing here. Um, so there are a couple of methods. Um, actually, EY has applied a method called the delta method, um, delta method of, for moments, to remove bias and variational inference. This is a delta method variational inference. This was a paper 2007. I think nobody really has picked it up, and actually it contains the IWE already. Not under the name IWE, of course. But um, <coughs> So you can do this. This requires a, a kind of um, a bit of analytic special casing for, the, for, this, uh, for this case. Uh, um, and I also have a theoretical analysis in the paper of the DVI method, so the bias variance expressions and um, empirical comparison. But what I want to do is uh, I want to use a different method. Um, which is a more general method, and these are based on resampling. And one method that, I, um, uh, that the paper deals with is a jackknife bias correction. So who has, who has heard of the jackknife? Okay, a few at least, good. What you see in a typical textbook is first order jackknife, and that's where most textbooks stop, actually all textbooks stop. And in the 70s, long ago, uh, before I was born, some people extended the jackknife to higher order variations, and these are not covered in ordinary textbooks. And so I, dig, I duck my way through the literature, so you don't have to, and I provide a nice summary in the paper if you're interested in higher order bias correction. Um, there are other bias correction methods. There are higher order bootstrap based bias correction, and there's also a very powerful thing called the debiasing lemma, which um, um, Heiko Stratman and Arthur Gretten and so on have used quite successfully also in, in, uh, at Gatsby, uh, which is a very powerful method, but it also requires a special case analysis. So the generic ones are these two, and let's look at just the jackknife. <coughs> So it's a super simple idea. So I can actually, you only have to remember one figure, and you get the idea, and you can derive it from that figure. So here's a figure that you have to remember. Let's say you have an estimator evaluated on n samples. OK? And you record the estimator, the value. This has some variance. You just evaluate it. It has some variance. For example, the sample variance. You have n samples. You compute the sample variance. You get a value. And on the x-axis, you put not n, the sample size, but 1 over n. Right? So what do we want? If our estimator has certain properties like consistency, so if you have more and more samples, the IWE had this property, then it becomes exact. Right? So if it has this property, what we really want here, my, my clicker died, apologize, is to evaluate uh, this function here at 1 over infinity, at 0. Right? This would be the exact truth. Um, this is what we want to estimate. This is a true quantity. So for example, the IWE is a biased, uh, it's a lower bound still, so it would always be below this green dot in expectation. Right? So here's a simple, simple idea. You just remove one sample from your data set. For example, you take n minus 1 fresh samples, and you record the estimator that you get at n minus 1 samples, and then you do linear regression. And you hit the y-axis, and you say, this is my guess. Right? This is your bias-corrected estimator. I mean, it's such a simple idea. Can it, can it even work? Uh, actually, it can work. It can work quite successfully. And you can think of this as a linear form. You can generalize this to polynomials. There's a deep link to series acceleration methods, to, to other, um, other forms. You get um, a nice form, which is a weighted combination of estimators. 
So the new estimator of a certain order m is defined as a weighted combination of estimators derived from smaller number of samples. Um, so for example here, <coughs> if the order is zero, you get the original estimator. If the order is one, you get the first order jack If the order is two, you get this expression of combining different estimators. And the key result here is that, um, so this is, when I apply this to the IWAE, exactly this method to the IWAE, it uh, very quickly debiases, so the bias zero should be zero here. Uh, the first order method already kicks off the first order bias term, which is dominant in this case, and so you get a nice debiasing already. Um, but moreover, you actually get polynomial debiasing. So if the order is, uh, is m, you get an, uh, um, uh, one, over, 1 over k to the power of m plus 1 uh, bias reduction. So you reduce the bias to that order. So it's very effective. Um, here's a graphical demonstration. This is a log-log plot. Log-log plots are nice because you can see the order directly by the slope. So these are the jackknife variation inference, so the applying the jackknife methodology to the IWAE uh, of various orders. And you see also EY's delta method variation inference estimator. And you see that you basically, <coughs> not only the order is as the theory predicts, but actually the elbow here has a bias of eight nuts. Uh, in this case, and you can reduce that massively, and computation is almost for free. Uh, you can reduce it with just five samples. So you draw five samples. The IWE would give you two nuts or something bias. The JVI corrected version gives you already 0 0.08 or something like that. Um, so that's, that's great. To match that, you would need 80 samples for the IWE. Um, here's an experiment on a variation autoencoder for MNIST. This is just training a variation autoencoder and afterwards using this evidence estimate uh, uh, to estimate that. So you, the, IWA, the IWAE at the one extreme contains the, the uh, elbow and the JVI family contain, contains both the IWAE and the elbow, of course. So it, it's basically a strict generalization also of the IWAE. And you see that with increased order, you get basically bias reduction, very effective bias reduction, even for very small order of k for a number of samples. Um, all right, now I, I have to stop myself in a, in a minute. There's one interesting thing. So now we have a better evidence estimate. Can we train using it? Can we just, in, you know, people train VAEs with IWAE objectives. Can we train with this improved objective? Clearly it's improved, statistical theory says it's improved. Experiments say it's improved, uh, improved in the sense of a better estimate of the evidence. Surely this should help training a model. And it doesn't fail, but it doesn't strictly improve over IWAE in terms of training. So if I train a model using JVI and then evaluate using JVI, I should expect a better objective on the test set than if I train using IWAE and then evaluate with JVI. So JVI always gives better uh, estimates, but it doesn't seem to help the training very much. I mean, it, it doesn't kind of collapse horribly, but this is now a question, why does it not help? And I think this is, a, to stop myself now, but essentially, think of the infinite limit case of an unbiased evidence estimator in a variational autoencoder setting. So you have an encoder decoder. If you would get unbiased estimates uh, of, the, of the evidence, there would be no gradient for the encoder. The gradient would completely vanish because for any output of the encoder, if it has full support, you could even use a prior, it would be an unbiased estimate of the evidence. Uh, and if that's the case, the encoder doesn't learn and that will lead to learning problems. So my hypothesis is that actually <coughs> uh, uh, higher order debiasing or like effective debiasing actually deteriorates learning in the encoder massively. And a way to test the hypothesis is actually to use two objectives. I compute the JVI, update the decoder parameters, but I still use the normal elbow objective to code the encoder. So I haven't tested that yet, but that's kind of the way it stands. So sorry for going one minute over time, but thank you for your attention. The code is online at GitHub, Microsoft, and so on. Paper is online, reviews are online. Uh, <laughs> so thank you very much. Do you have questions why the next speaker sets up? Yeah? Uh, thanks for a great talk. It's really interesting. Um, learning using the variational methods or learning the proposals, that was like a dangerous idea. <laughs> because, you, because of the compact, because of your first figure, right? The, the Q distribution or 
I know you're really fond of that, Argus. I should really try it. <laughs> but then that connects to now to work that Frank Wood's group has done, and they, they've done some analysis. Yeah, Tom, Tom Rainford has done, actually, the, the variance and bias results that I derived uh, is um, so simultaneously independently, but Tom Rainford derived more general results for nested Monte Carlo estimates, which cover that. Um, I should have said that. Uh, I apologize. Um, indeed. And I think. There's more to try. I think there may be something very basic we miss on how to systematically improve variational inference method, and that's what, what drives me and excites me about this. One thought experiment is um, is a prediction. I haven't tested it yet, but if you take IWAE and you uh, increase k, the order of k, I think the encoder will revert back to the prior mm -hmm. systematically because there's this important sampling interpretation of, of IWAE, and eventually it will become very over-dispersed. And that's precisely the phenomenon that the gradient will vanish, I think. So that's a testable hypothesis. Uh, I haven't tested it yet, but I'm sticking my head out. So uh, let's see. So thank you very much. Next speaker is Alex.